Hello and welcome to episode number 22 of Kit Room, episode number Gail Clichy. I'm running out of shirt number uh, players, so uh, we'll stick with that for the time being. Uh, I hope you're well. How How's the family? Tell your mother I said hello. Um, hmm. uh, yes, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, if you are a returning uh, visitor, if, if you are a first time watcher, listener, hello. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I hope you enjoy. Uh, if you do, please subscribe. Um before I ramble on for much longer, let me throw it over to our guest. So, Mr. Guest, uh, who are you and what do you do? Uh, well, who do you work for and uh, what do you do for said place? Hello, Ollie, uh, and thanks so much for having me on. My name is Jason Klein. As you can hear from my accent, uh, I, I work in America. I'm the digital content manager for Forward Madison FC. We're a third division club in Wisconsin, uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and I do all of our online content. So that's social media, website, uh, everything, well, except the kits. I just promote those. Um, yeah, I mean, with it being a third, third division team in Wisconsin, normally you'd think, who who knows about them? Like I I could potentially reel off a third division team in the UK and, and see what happens. However, um, Ford Madison are, are pretty pretty trendy for their kits, which we will get to uh, very shortly indeed. But uh, before we do start, I think you're you're wearing a club hoodie. I think it looks very yeah, nice. I, am. I like the color. Yeah. Thank you. It's uh, pink on the top, and then uh, blue in the middle, and and gray on the bottom. It's it's one of my favorites. Oh, that's delightful. Uh, I'm wearing the <laughs> Season, I can't remember. I think it's 2019, 2020. Uh, Vancouver Whitecaps uh, home shirt. My favorite thing about this one, which uh, if any kit designers are uh, watching, pay attention. The design goes all the way round to the back. Oh, you just don't see it anymore, do you? A proper hoop. A, pro- a, a proper hoop. Um, Celtic are livid that someone's stealing their hoops. Um <laughs> Yeah, so uh, let's jump into who Ford Madison are. So uh, the team was founded in 2018 um, and it played the first season in uh, 2019. Um, how did the team come about? How's it gone? And um, there's a little little thing going around at the moment uh, called the coronavirus. So uh, how, have, how have things gone with that? Yeah, so like you said, our team is relatively new, especially compared to pretty much any any club you'd find in England apart from MK Dons. Um, <laughs> but that's because in America, the, the professional soccer scene, at least the one that exists now, is very much coming into its moment. Over the past 10 or 15 years, there's been an explosive growth in the number of Uh, professional teams because people are more interested in the sport for whatever reasons you have. Maybe it's because internet access makes it easier to watch big time soccer uh, anywhere in the world that more kids got into FIFA. Um, Either way there, there's a, a, a big interest and that interest has been reflected even in a relatively smaller city like Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, We're the state capital. We've also got uh, quite a big university here, but it's still only a city of 250,000. And once you take out the student population, which is only here for the summer, that goes down around 50,000. But what's unique about us is that even though we're in have a much smaller population than a lot of the teams in our league, we've still been able to make it work. Uh, we've really relied on building community, making this the sort of club that you can really have a lot of civic pride for, knowing that where we live, not everyone is going to be born a soccer fan, uh, but if you live in Madison, you're probably a fan of the city. So we want to inspire that in you. Uh, they're the Union Berlin of the uh, USL <laughs> one. Um, no, that that's that's all well and good. Uh, I mean, that is shocking to hear the the 
uh, I was going to say capacity then. God, I am football focused. Uh, the the population of the area with with the students and then the just general citizens. So I I currently live in in Birmingham. Um, there's like three universities here and a lot of colleges. I imagine it's probably a similar number in terms of city centre anyway. Um, mm. But yeah, that's 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 uh, eye opening because I was looking at uh, just at the Wikipedia, just the history of the team, and it's like the average attendance is like four thousand. Yeah, I mean, well, that's non-COVID attendance. Well, of course, of but, course. The, the, well, the great part is that we had a, a big part of it set up. So there's um, a stadium, Bree Stevens Field, that is right in the middle of downtown. There's the state capitol building is in the middle, and we're like two blocks down from that. And this is, well, it was originally an old baseball field that was built in 1926, So it's been around for nearly a hundred years and it's been converted over the years into a bunch of different things. So in the early 1930s, I believe there were a few NFL games that got played there. Um, Later it turned into a track stadium. Um, And then the, the university teams played soccer here in, in the seventies and somehow it survived through all this time, the city at one point was negotiating to sell it and and destroy it because it wasn't getting much use, but it it stayed alive. Uh, We came in and we we and the city spent some money on renovations. And now, I mean, there are so many people living around it, especially young people, the type of people here, at least, that are really into this sport. Uh, that are are likely to support us and really make it an incredible atmosphere. Yeah, I've I've seen pictures of the stadium. I've seen pictures of the club shop as well. The club shop looks stunning. It, isn't it, it's <laughs> under one of the tiers, isn't it? It's under one yeah. of the yeah. Yes, it, it looks oh, it looks great. I need to um, and I, 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 well, I need to get a passport sorted, and then and then <laughs> COVID needs to do one uh, and then and then eventually in twenty twenty four probably. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but looking at the setup of the club, uh, there seems to be a lot of fan engagement that I've seen on Twitter, um, into like the logos being voted on kits, colors kind of thing. Um, this also reflects in a, in a major Twitter presence, which, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with, with your job. Um, so how, uh, how, how, how did this, how does it come about? What, what, why this particular, uh, mode and what is fan culture like in America? Look, it's very intentional, and I hope it can serve as a model for other lower league clubs because we know right off the bat that we don't have the same resources as a really big club, a a major league soccer team. Um, When we're trying to figure out how we're going to get supporters in the stands, we can't, you know, buy a billboard or get ourselves on a TV advertisement so instead, the, the way that we do it is engaging fans online through social media. And even though we don't have the same number of followers as some of these big teams, um, it, it's still sort of an equalizer for us because it's the same platform. We can reach people in Madison really all over the world. There's a reason I'm talking to you right now. Uh, and and I... I really believe that when you have an interaction with a club online, it helps you become a fan. And once you've become a fan, you might tell a friend, you might become an evangelizer for us. So you, you start building it brick by brick. And then uh, as, as people become attached to the project and more importantly, feel like they're part of the project, they're a stakeholder in it, uh, then they're going to spread that to their friends as well. And that's how you end up building a community. Definitely. Um, and I'm going to drop a second teaser to it. The kits also help, which we will get to. <laughs> Everyone hold your horses. Um, but in terms of uh, Madison, in, uh, in in terms of the city, um, how, how welcoming has the community been to the um, to the, to the club? Uh, have, have, have they chipped in in terms of helping set anything up or what, what's happened? It's been incredible. I mean, we have a, a supporters group called The Flock and they've got several, uh, yeah, I know, right? It's an incredible name. Um, it, it, it's an independent uh, group of, of supporters that, 
you know, really formed out of these people who are mostly already fans of the sport, but didn't have a team. Uh, and, and there are several subsidiaries under that group um, as, as well. And they've been absolutely tremendous in uh, whipping up fan support and really starting to create a culture. You can't do it in two years. I, I understand that, but uh, this is the time where we can start to lay the foundations. And it's, it's really been our supporters in many ways who have taken the initiative uh, to set up what the future of this club is going to look like. No, oh, definitely, and and um, I'm sure with with the student culture as well. Uh, mm-hmm. I think American uh, college sports, anyways, is is it gets a lot more attention than the the UK uh, university yeah. college sports. So um, I imagine that is is going to be a, a big helping hand too. Well, yeah, that's it, it's sort of funny because that's the the big deal in town, really. Uh, the University of Wisconsin is here, and their football, men's basketball, women's volleyball teams are, are just, and obviously ice hockey, given where we live, are just enormous. Um, so the, the football team has an 80,000 seat stadium that they uh, sell out for every game. Uh, it's much bigger than us, really. Uh, but we, we sort of fill in a gap there because uh, the colleges play in their fall and spring semesters but most of our season is in the summer. So there, there's always been one, a, a sporting gap uh, due to the, the temporal factor and another uh, because we're a, a professional team, right? Um, not that anybody cares if you're watching amateur football players here because it's all about the pride you have for Wisconsin, but uh, I think we fill a unique role in the in the Madison sports landscape. And again, I, I might have mentioned it earlier, but even though there's a big student population, a lot of our fan base aren't students. They're people who are either young professionals or families with kids um, who can sort of identify with us as a representative of the city. It was it was mentioned, but not really uh, touched on much. How has um, I don't know in terms of how the league has carried on with this past year, should we say? Mm-hmm. Um, so has, has the league been put on pause? Because I know some uh, in the in the UK, some of the lower leagues were uh, outside of professional um, tiers. Uh, they were just cancelled. Uh, some were put on pause. It was a whole mess. Um, but how how what happened to um, the uh, the league that you're in? I forgot the late name of it already. <laughs> USL League One. I know it's well. I was gonna say, but I was gonna say NSL. I was like, no, <laughs> that's not it. That's wrong. Um, well, obviously, it was difficult for everyone. It was difficult for us as well. Coming into our second season, uh, we had planned a lot to to grow to hopefully sell out our stadium a little bit more, um, and we were put on hold for a couple of months while we waited to figure out what we were going to do. Eventually, the league did get started again. We did play a shortened season, but the thing was we couldn't actually play in Madison um, because they had a rule that you you couldn't play co- full contact sports. You, you, you couldn't play soccer. So even if we wanted to do it in an empty stadium with no fans, we weren't allowed. That also meant we weren't allowed to do our training sessions here as well. Um, so we were doing our training sessions and playing matches um, like a 90 minute drive outside of Madison. Uh, And we still had some of our season ticket holders show up. We, we were allowed like a small percentage of capacity where we were playing. Um, It it was a really difficult year for us. in in that sense, Uh, I think that the team uh, they finished lower in the standings than any of us really wanted to. I think that's partly a reflection of some of the difficulties they had to face that um, none of the other clubs in our, our league were dealing with. And then, well, I can't complain about it too much. Can I? We, we still have a job here. The, the club is still on good footing. 
And uh, as we're starting to get vaccines into the population, we're, we're preparing to come back hopefully to Madison this year. All, all, all on the up. Um, but that seems similar. I was, when I was talking to Marty from um, Vancouver Whitecaps, they uh, they they couldn't cross the border if if they wanted to continue playing. They weren't allowed to to leave Canada and then come back. So so they had to to shack up in a hotel in Portland. I think they were staying in, um, and they had to stay there for a couple months. Uh, and that that was their base of operation, which is just madness. Um, but obviously. It was for a good cause, of course. Um, the, the the border restrictions, not not uh, the fact that they have to stay in a hotel. Um, so let's let, before we jump on to, to kits, let's talk about um, something I'm quite curious on. Why why a flamingo? Um, I'm not too sure. Uh, my, my my knowledge on on Wisconsin isn't fantastic, so I don't know if flamingos are native there. Um, <laughs> but but why a flamingo? And um, the club colours are very vibrant. Uh, and, and loud. How did they come about? Because you don't tend to see them, really. Well, well, you are correct. Uh, flamingos are not native to Wisconsin, but there's still a good reason for it. Um, so, like I've said before, we really try to center this club around community. The name itself, Forward, is the state motto of Wisconsin. It's on our state flag, our, our state coin, things like that. And the flamingo as well is a, a reference to Madison that you probably wouldn't get if you didn't live here. It goes back to something that happened in 1979 uh, at the university when there was this group of pranksters that uh, planted a thousand and eight plastic pink flamingos uh, on, on the big hill in the center of campus right before the first day of university. So the students woke up, they saw it, no idea what was going on, started taking photos. It got into the newspapers uh, and it became this, this city legend uh, where people would take home the flamingo and put it in their backyard and it's still there 30 years later. It was turned into postcards. In fact, the official city bird is the plastic flamingo. So when when we were forming our club, uh, we used that as, as sort of a reference to this niche city history, but also in a way to uh, start to identify our brand as something that was, you know, not really buttoned up that could be more irreverent and loose. Uh, a flamingo in a, a winter wonderland of Wisconsin is a, a great way to show that. So it's something that we started with, started as a joke. Uh, we took it and ran with it. And now it's uh, going out into the world and, and people are finding out what a flamingo really has to do with Madison, Wisconsin. That is phenomenal. Um, I didn't know that. That's amazing. But I <laughs> guess that's also... Um, that kind of goes in partnership with the exotic kit colors. So you've got blue and white, pink, and <laughs> so it's like vibrant. So it's so out of there, like completely polar opposite to the city that it kind of works. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, it's a reflection of the city. I've always thought of Madison as a place that doesn't take itself too seriously. It's not like an especially gritty town. It's uh, somewhere where, you know, there's a lot of young people, a lot of students, a place that likes to have fun, a place that likes to be a little silly sometimes. So in a way, the, the flamingo and like you said, the kits are a reflection of that. We don't want to do things in a boring, old fashioned way. Well, of course. So, so uh, we will we will relieve everyone of the tease now, and we'll talk about the kits. Um, there's one in particular uh, which I have spoken to to Cassidy before. Uh, Cassidy uh, Sebnisky, am I saying that right? Yeah, Sebnisky. Yeah. Oh, I got it right. Yes. Um, so I, I saw it written down. I was like, I'm going to butcher this, but no. Um, I've spoken to her before on, a, on another series. Um, I don't know how many people watched it, so if I still have that video clip, I, I will chuck it in at the end of this um, this interview, because it's really interesting on how the, the design came about and the short turnaround that they had. Um, but uh, how have Hummel been? Because uh, 
in in Europe in the UK um they're a bit of an, an enigma um everyone seems to love them they've had some wild designs from from back in the day uh, and they're they're slowly but surely coming back especially into the UK um they they have a couple teams on their roster now and um it's really exciting so so how is it like working with them well i think the thing that's made our partnership with Hummel really successful is that they allow us a lot of freedom. I mean, there's been a lot of talk in recent years about uh, big companies, partnerships, especially in MLS, where teams don't get a lot of creative control. So you come out with a lot of kits that all look the same and aren't very unique. Uh, The thing about Hummel is they say, hey, you design what you want and we'll put it on the kit. And and that's exactly what happens. Um, You mentioned Cassidy, who's our our kit designer in chief, uh, who's just come up with some incredible designs over the past couple of years. And we've been able to sublimate them onto those kits. I I think this year, for at least the home kit, we're also considering putting a raised badge on there as well. That's something that people have wanted. Uh, So... It, it, it's a, a partnership that works for both of us, right? Um, they give us the the tools and uh, we come up with the, the creative designs. And that's something that's helped us stand out. That's something that's helped us be successful. So you're in the second season now, right? Or third? Going into the third season, we've, we've played two, yeah. Right, and, and how many sets of kits have you had? Because um, there's there's one which screams out, which is the, the drip kit, which came out uh, around this time last year, right? Or a bit late last year? Yeah, yeah, late last year. Um, well, we've, we've had one home kit for both years. Uh, we, we switched the away kit each year, and we switched the alternate for each year. And right. then we also... I mean, we do something a little different with our goalkeeper kits. And then we've also created um, a few ones outside of that for for charities, for local charities. Um, We partnered with a local artist to create a Black Lives Matter training top last year. Um, And we also partnered with our supporters last year to create um, sort of this supporters kit uh, to benefit LGBTQ charities here. So it's something that we see as part of for Madison and uh, we want to keep doing it in a way. Uh, We want to use that for good. Yeah, I, I just quickly check classic football shirts because um, they they've been recently getting quite a few batches of your different kits, and and the 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 third shirt, the drip kit, it uh, sells out immediately as soon as it touches <laughs> the website, it's gone. But the, the, there are some other designs up at the moment. So as you say, there's the the uh, Hummel uh, Ford Madison Pride fan shirt that that's available. You've got the away yeah. shirt, the goalkeeper shirt, the home shirt. Um, which is your favorite kit if you have one? I mean, it's got to be the drip kit, right? You've already mentioned it, our alternate for this past year that Cassidy designed. I think the story behind it is very cool that um, there is this artistic trend that she really liked called hydro dipping, uh, where I think you mix spray paint in, in a small bath and typically you would dip a canvas in it Uh, and get these different colors that flow around. But when she did that, she transferred what was on the canvas to her computer and turned it into the kit design. I know she's been hard at work at uh, coming up with a new alternate for this year. It's a, a pretty big bar to set. Yeah, she's she's really shot herself in the foot uh, in terms of topping that kit. Um, but but all credit to her. My my fingers are crossed for her uh, that she she does do very well because the the third kit and if she's had a hand in designing all the others as well, that she's incredibly good at her job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's I mean, it's something where when you let people have a bit of creative freedom who really have a passion for what they do, it shines through. That's something that uh, I think is the beauty of lower league soccer, uh, that you can 
have so much freedom to to do what you want to really feel like you're involved with the club something that's missing at a lot of top level football at least these days definitely and um the i can't remember if i if i did ask uh this oh no sorry no ignore me there um but the the designs that cassidy makes i don't know if these this question would be more for her um but i'm guessing the designs are kind of influenced by the logo in some because they're very tropical i'm thinking of the goalkeeper shirts with the palm leaves they look more like what you'd expect from into miami uh <laughs> than, than a team in wisconsin <laughs> Yeah, you're not the first one to mention that. Some of them have definitely been influenced by the logo. Uh, the the alternate kit the in 2019, which was also an absolute banger, um, was something that was supposed to have like flamingo wings on it. Uh, the the tropical themed goalkeeper kits that we did were definitely inspired by flamingos. Others though uh, have been inspired by other sources. So our home kit, which is getting a bit of a revamp this year, is designed to look like the city. Uh, So it's got blue on either sides, that's our lakes, and then a sash down the middle, uh, which is how if you go to Google Maps and and look at the city of Madison, it's what we look like. we're we're an isthmus which means we've got lakes on both sides of us oh wow i've I've just quickly googled that is insane (laughs) okay i i see that (laughs) that, because because like this the sash is also a very historic football shirt design um but but no i i I love that reasoning that is amazing um And, and then i think the the away kit um this past year as well um it had every single name of our season ticket holders uh printed in between the lines so again it it's not necessarily like playing off the logo but it is trying to connect to something that's either in our supporters culture in madison culture in for madison itself fantastic um and then just final touches on on the drip kit it kind of in a way, it made the team global because that was the first I heard about them. Uh, yeah. I, I, I just remember seeing it on Twitter and being like, this is like so different. Um, I imagine it's also had some global purchases too. Um, are, are you privy to that information? Do you know where they've, they've been sent off to? Yeah, I believe... Uh, I know we've sold merchandise. I don't know if about just kits, but I know we've sold merchandise in at least 28 countries. Um, For the kits, we have, obviously we have uh, suppliers in the US, but we're also on classic football shirts and stateside shirts in the UK. And I think Hummel Japan sells some of our our kits in Japan as well. Um, It's it's been really, really cool. Um, We had some attention, before at least in europe we we have a a fan who lives in switzerland who's a season ticket holder um and in in 2019 she flew to madison for a weekend just to come to one of our games so uh, it's it goes back to that power of social media having the same platform as any other club in the world and being able to meet people no matter where you're at especially during this past year in a pandemic when we're limited on how much we can really have face-to-face interaction. Uh, you sometimes substitute that for meeting people in, in the digital world. Like, you know, I am with you right now. <laughs> no, hundred percent. I've, um, I've met a lot of people uh, through, through lockdown, through doing this series as well. Um, one of the, like a, a few people down in Australia as well, which uh, mm. it's, boggling that uh normally it's told stranger danger on the internet but uh instead of mine i'm quite the opposite it was like you want to follow do you want my bank details so cool um <laughs> <laughs> um but uh yeah so so ford madison has gone global uh and i will be keeping an eye out on their twitter for uh, new, new kit releases as i'm sure a lot of people in the shirt community and who will be watching this will do as well um i know the drip kit is 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 has reached many homes here in the uk uh yeah. and and a lot of people have it and i i don't yet but uh no uh <laughs> as you say state sides have it at the moment so i will next payday 
Um, if if state sides are watching, uh, look out for my bank details. Um, but thank you very much for joining me. Uh, I'm all out of questions. Uh, but if there's anything else you want to quickly touch on before we go, is there anything? I think you've covered it, Ollie. I I I thought I so. Um, we've got your history. Well, well, actually, we need to know what what's next for Forward Madison. Um, what's what's in the future? Uh, obviously, drive to try and climb the leagues, but um. Anything that we should add calendars dates to? Any new kit releases or anything? Yeah, well, we've that got you can say of, anyway. <laughs> uh, I'm 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 trying to think. I think we might have some new kit releases planned for April. Alternate kit this year. I don't know when that's planned yet. That might be a little later. But our season is pushed back this year. Um, so we're starting around May eighth. Um, historically, those games have been able, uh, international viewers have been able to watch those games on YouTube for free, which is great, uh, as long as you can stay up that late. <laughs> um, but I, we've got a new manager this year, uh, a man from Newcastle originally by the name of Carl Craig, former coach for Minnesota United, who are now in Major League Soccer. Um, and I think the goal this year is while we want to continue doing what we've always done off the field, we want to add an on-field element to that too. So if, if we can uh, if we can win a championship in some of these new kits, I would be I would be very pleased. I look forward to it. Um, and if I'm ever working the late shift at work, I'm I'm into one a.m. Yeah. I'm into one a.m. So uh, I will definitely be keeping an eye on your YouTube to see if there's any games on because uh, it does get does get quite quiet and boring um <laughs> but thank you very much uh, for joining me At each episode i get the guests to recommend either a song artist or album for people to check out because as we all know uh, arts industry has been one of the heavier hit ones uh from from the pandemic uh so if you would like to recommend someone something an album for people to go check out who who's your who's your go-to uh, i feel like i've got to recommend this because there's actually one one song inspired by Forward Madison. Uh, there's a local band here called The Racing Pulses that wrote uh, wrote a song called Go Forward. <laughs> if you can find it, it, it's it's a little cheesy, but I like it a lot. It's it's really funny. I am, so I'd recommend that. I'm searching it on on YouTube right now, and if I can find yeah. it, I it's, found it's it. It's going on my watch later. I'll be watching this as soon as uh, I'll be listening to that when when, when we end <laughs> this recording. They've got a music video as well. I, I, found, I found the music <laughs> video. Yeah. They, they filmed it at our stadium. Oh, brilliant! I'm 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 actually really looking forward to that. Perfect. Um, yeah, thank you very very much for joining me. Um, if if anyone would like to go uh, find out more about Ford Madison, uh, find you on your socials. Where is the best place to go? Please follow us online. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, if you just search for Madison FC, I'm sure you'll find us. And we try to interact with as many people as possible. So send us a note and, and we'll get back to you. Perfect. And uh, if I still have the interview uh, video file with Cassidy, I will chuck that in here now. Yes, so uh, my name is Cassidy Sentneski. Uh, I'm the graphic designer for Ford Madison FC here in Madison, Wisconsin, and I design kits sometimes. <laughs> so you've just released quite a striking kit. Um, it was the alternative kit for this season, is it? Yes, uh, so it'll be our third kit um, for the 2020 season. And you've kind of blended the, the two home and away kits together in, in terms of colour. Um, where, where did the design of that shirt come from <laughs> yes yeah, so uh there's a team of us i call us the kit crew it hasn't quite caught on in the office yet but i'm gonna keep pushing it um so chase kuba and i uh we work really closely on getting these kits kind of from conception to execution every year and they always have a very strong vision about how they want their lineup to go and then i kind of execute and so they came to me with a very um street style vibe they wanted you know a direction that was going to be a lot different from anything we've ever done before uh, and they they pulled up an old brazil kit uh, i can't even find it when i google it i have no idea where it came from um, 
of just this beautiful swirling like pattern of all the Brazil colors. And they were like color mesh. Color mesh was the color we or the words we kept throwing around. Color mesh, color mesh, color mesh. I think I heard that probably a hundred times. And so then they kind of left it in my hands to figure out how to get it onto a shirt, uh, which I turned to the internet. <laughs> As I, was, I normally do. Yeah, I was going to say, did 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 the club go to you with like a brief because it's such like a striking bold design that surely the club must have had some hand in it because I can't imagine many clubs receiving that and being like, Oh yeah, that's great. (laughs) Um, so I think every year we kind of know that the third kit is going to be a little bit off the wall. Um, I mean, this is only our second year as a club in Madison and our first year we had kind of a similar style in the sense that it was when you looked at it, you're like, what is going on? Like this is very, in your face and so we knew we wanted to do something similar this year and they do i mean they do approve everything we kind of do um in that sense so because the rest of the kits like even the keeper kits this year they're they're pretty great i had a look at them all on the website um so can you talk a little bit through the design process from from getting the, the the brief to it finally becoming a shirt yeah uh so it was a whirlwind honestly uh we pretty much pulled this kit together in less than two weeks um, from the day we decided we needed to go in a different direction to actually getting it to the production uh, level for sampling. Um, And so, yeah, it was definitely like, I walked into the office, they were like, we need a new kit. Um, the, The ideas we'd been throwing around before just weren't translating well onto fabric. And so we were at crunch time. Um, I walked in, they briefed me. I actually went home and definitely shed a couple tears a little bit, you know, overwhelmed. I'm like, we are not going to pull this off. I went straight to the craft store and bought a bunch of paint. And I follow a lot of artists on Twitter. Um, I think Facebook has gotten my video algorithm down to being like street art and uh, kind of those, you know, people painting, um, you know, with on the, on the street, like street art and stuff. I see a lot of it. And so I had seen hydro dipping online quite a few times. And I was like, I think this could be a great way to execute what we want here. Um, so I grabbed a bunch of spray paints. I came home and I actually that night just started hydro dipping in my kitchen. Um, and just, and the process is you get a little, I had a little tub of water, you start spray painting the colors you want into the water, Uh, you swirl them around, and then you dip a canvas in it, and it creates this like beautiful movement. Uh, I brought an example. Um, So this is one of the canvases from that that first night that um, was kind of the day we decided to go in this direction. Uh, And so I knew right when I saw them come out of the water that this was gonna kind of be the way to go. Wow, all right, okay. Um, and so now that makes a bit more sense knowing the, the two week deadline. I saw, I mentioned you via email, I saw on Twitter that people were mentioning uh, the, the, the struggle that the design team went through. So that makes a bit more sense now. <laughs> yeah, we, we knew we wanted to wear these in our Open Cup uh, game, which actually got scheduled before our home opener at home and so we had like a six to eight week turn time usually on kits to get go from like production to getting them in hand for enough for the team and we were at that six to eight week like mark (laughs) in January (laughs) like we gotta go (laughs) so I was going to ask where the influence come from however so you, you kind of touched on that already um so you it was pretty quick then from from getting the design to the finished article then Mm -hmm. yeah uh i think the the fastest part about it was actually getting home and doing the canvases from there it took about two to three days of translating it onto the computer cleaning up those lines and just going through and detailing every single line um and really making sure the colors were how I wanted them to, and then sticking true to the original movement of the piece that we chose. And so uh, the cleaning up part was probably the longest, longest part of that whole process. Just like me meticulously staring at a computer screen, like, okay, this line curves this way, like clean it up as we go. Um, But we got there. Yeah. So, um, and then this kit is being made by Hummel as well. Um, can you touch a little bit on, on your working relationship with Hummel? What's that like? 
Yeah, uh, I know Chase and Kubo and Peter Wilt, um, kind of our uh, genius uh, club starter from last year, uh, when they were picking out club or kit producers, Hummel was big in the conversation due to their sublimation abilities. Uh, I think that has played a key role in our relationship with them. Um, immediately when they realized we had an in-house designer, they gave us templates. Uh, they were like, go for it. Um, we got a lot of freedom from them, obviously within their brand standards, you know, the Chevron stay on this year, we got to add the, the mark with the B, which I love. I think it's a, a classic, classic logo. And then, but overall, they've just been honestly very supportive of our design process. Uh, and then actually this year, they allowed us to switch manufacturing to be out of the United States. Uh, so we pivoted to a manufacturer out in California when the whole COVID-19 uh, <laughs> shook the world. And, uh, but they've been extremely supportive of that. And so I think Hummel, the whole step of the way, has kind of given us the freedom to breathe here. and just produce things that work for our team rather than kind of handing us down a template that might not be for us. What have they thought of the design or do you know that? What was that? What have they thought about the design or, or do you know what they think? Uh, we reached out to them right when we got it and immediately got great feedback. Um, usually Hummel US, there's like the two divisions. Hummel US uh, has and like pretty much always been supportive of our stuff. But this year, Hummel, the international kind of uh, European side of things was like, yeah, we're going to promote this. Like, this is good. <laughs> so they backed um, this kit right away when they saw it. So that was, that was good to hear. And um, I don't suppose you know how, like, any global orders yet. I mean, I'll definitely be getting one eventually. Um, uh, I was talking to Chase yesterday, and he said all international orders have to be um, – like emailed in because we don't have international shipping list listed on the website yet. Uh, he said his inbox was full. Um, he could not keep up with his inbox. And so I know the international response has just been incredible. Uh, I feel absolutely floored by the response overall. I did not anticipate um, this kit kind of going global, which is wild. And if I don't, then that's the end of the episode. <laughs> so everyone, thank you very much for joining, listening, watching, whatever you do during these episodes. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Please leave a like if you did. Um, if you didn't, uh, maybe not leave a dislike, but you can if you want. Uh, and why not leave a comment? Who knows? Um, if you're listening on podcast platforms, thank you very much. Please subscribe on your platform of choice and these episodes will come right into your feed as soon as they are out. Uh, but uh, once again, Jason, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you so much, Ali. It was a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. And uh, everyone, thank you for watching. I will be back with another episode very soon indeed. Bye-bye. <laughs>